So you will see the red here. It is the live. Hello, hello. Hi, Ray. Hello, sir. How you doing? Good. How are you? Well, thank you. Good, good. So I'm so glad. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm happy to host my fellow author, Rick Road, today. With this chat, it's called History Chat Today. My name is Sarah M. I am an author, and um, my book is called How I Survived the Killing Fields. But I'm not talking about my book today. Today we have our presenter, Rick Road. Our presenter today is a 10-time non-fiction book author and an authority on American history. His number 10 book is called They Made America Great. He spent most of his adult life living aboard boat and has traveled far and wide in America. Let's welcome Rick Rhodes. Hi, Rick. Thank you. And today's topic, we will be talking about John O'Neill. What do they say about John O'Neill? It's a one phrase that says, the man who knew that Al-Qaeda was going to strike inside the United States. So this month of September, we commemorate the nearly 3,000 lives lost on U.S. soil in New York City, the Pentagon, and aboard United Flight 93 22 years ago. But there was one FBI agent doing his very best to warn America of that threat. His warning mostly fell on deaf ears. John O'Neill was also killed on 9-11. Today we are going to learn his story. All right, I cannot wait to hear what Rick had to share with us. Rick, take it away. Yes, that is correct. Uh, he knew about Al-Qaeda before anybody else, but uh, too few people would listen to him. He was a serious and successful FBI agent, but he had some major flaws. He had a very entangled personal life. We'll get into that too. But he was truly married to the FBI, his one great love. Uh, he rose to the ranks of the FBI until about 2000. And then he was forced to retire early. He worked tirelessly in the, and he was working on Osama bin Laden for the last two years. It was a maverick in the FBI and clashed with FBI culture. He sounded, but his flamboyant and swashbuckling style at the FBI worked against him. Back when he was growing up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, his mother and father drove one taxi cab. His favorite childhood show, and I remember it well also, was the FBI with Edward Zimbalist Jr. He was Catholic and served as an altar boy at his uh, Catholic church and went to a Catholic high school. He learned much growing up on the streets of Atlantic City. He, John O'Neill married his high school sweetheart, Christine, but that love affair didn't last very long. He, and he would, even though he wouldn't divorce her because he said it was a Catholic thing, albeit not living with her, he made uh, her house payments and, and she received a pension and insurance payout. Later, in the later part of his FBI career, he had three long term love affairs all going on at the same time. And he told him that he was separated from his wife, which was not even true, but he didn't tell the other women about the other two women. So he was, he was you know, he was messed up in some ways. After, after growing up in Atlantic City, he went to American University, where he graduated in 1974. Then he went to George Washington University and got a degree in forensic sciences. While attending D.C. schooling, he worked part-time for the FBI, just what he wanted to do. He uh, worked as a 
fingerprint agent and as a tour clerk, and most tour clerks took one one shift a day or one group around a day. He typically took two and sometimes three. Couldn't get enough of the FBI. Uh, and when he got, well, started working on the FBI, I know this area well, the Hoover Building, he'd go outside and patronize the street vendors because he felt like, you know, I, I'm not going to go to a fancy restaurant. He would help the street vendors. And, and that was the way he was. And he worked long hours, even early in his career. One of his first assignments was white collar crime in the Baltimore, Washington area. And after that, he was assigned to the fourth most violent city in the United States. That was Chicago, Illinois. And the problem in Chicago was gangs. And John O'Neill quickly knew it. He understood that the new RICO laws, racketeering laws, you know, RICO stands for something like that, were, could be very helpful. And he was able to use that to get gang, gang people to uh, go on higher ups. And he also, he also uh, worked on FBI stuff uh, during his vacation. Uh, let's see here. This is I. Uh, he was serious and say, "Yeah, okay." Well, anyway, I'm, and he was a take ta take charge type of guy. He immersed himself in everything he did. He played he played hard and worked hard and did a lot of bar hopping in Chicago. He believed that life was meant to be gulped, not sipped. Uh, he, he was a hard working bon vivant, hard working bon vivant. If you can imagine such a thing. Had expensive clothing, lived from paycheck to paycheck, and friends advised him, you know, you got to save some money for the future. And he he was kind of fatalistic about that. Thought he wouldn't live that long. So end of his Chicago years, he was he was he was assigned to work on abortion bombing kind of place, abortion bombings, and it was kind of it was terrorism. And he really did his homework. He studied religious extremism and Catholicism, and he came to the conclusion that anything in the extreme is wrong and dangerous. And in 1993, if you remember, the first World Trade Center bombing occurred, and six were killed and more than a thousand injured in the underground parking garage. And then you remember that, okay? Yeah, a lot. I'm gonna bring back a lot of things that we should remember. And then soon after that, same year, Black Hawk Down incident happened, and Al Qaeda was. I just read more about that today. They're pretty much implicated very loosely in that, but they were. It was an ambush in Somalia, and after the Black Hawk Down incident, O'Neill was the lone government voice talking about Islamic extremists, and they're going to do something on U.S. soil. People, ah, nothing's going to happen. And then, in January 1995, he was promoted chief of the counterterrorism division at the FBI at 44 years old. There were only, like, I think, two less than two dozen section chiefs, and the next six years. He would be the tip of the spear fighting terrorism. And he also knew that the World Trade Center bombing was not going to be the last coming from Islamic terrorists. He trusts his instincts and very, and very leery of any religious extremism from wherever it came. After two years on the loose, he was instrumental in getting Ramzi Youssef, you might remember the name in Pakistan, the guy who was behind the World Trade Center parking lot bombing. And he put him behind bars and he couldn't do any more. And he had some other stuff in plan. And he, he knew the picture was even bigger than Ramsey Youssef. He, he, he found about Al-Qaeda and he believed Al-Qaeda was a bigger threat to the U.S. than Hamas or Hezbollah. Remember those names? He, he knew that and everybody said, ah, yeah, yeah, so what? And uh, Osama bin Laden was very low on FBI priorities watch list back in 1994. And he believed that it was not true. And he said, everything you need to know about Osama bin Laden can be found in Saudi Arabia. And he felt he was in the FBI's most important game in town. And uh, he traveled the world in all the developed countries, England, France, Germany, Italy, to nurture and cement relationships with other foreign officials who also worked against global terrorism. terrorism. And these connections proved to be invaluable. He became a supervisor and um, he worked as hard. It, it, he it's expected his subordinates to work as hard as he did. But once they knew his intensity and his rules, they just said they'd follow him anywhere. So he was a good supervisor. He did, he did take care of his people. His, his work credo was work hard and play hard. Uh, and many times his agents said, Why are we working so darn hard for all these things? And the answer always was, Because we are John O'Neill trained. He was generous, too, as a supervisor. When the detective's house burned down, he took care of him as best he could, you know, raising money and, uh, and did a couple of things. 
when his agents returned from a dangerous mission overseas, he was always at the airport and day or night greeting them. And um, not a you know, not a government people don't do that type of thing, but he did. And he was definitely married to the FBI. He appreciated strong personalities but he was not rigid and by the books. Now, you might remember this. In 1996, June, Kobar Barracks was hit by a suicide bomb in Saudi Arabia. 19 servicemen were killed and 400 were wounded, and the bomb was pretty powerful, more powerful than the Oklahoma truck city bombing many months before. The Saudis had refused to place bar barricades around the, the barracks. And uh, so after that happened, John O'Neill and FBI director Louis Free went to Saudi Arabia and, and um, they went to a bunch of meetings and O'Neill, a good reader of people and of human nature, told Free, I can't say what he said. He said, the Saudis are blowing smoke up your their year, but he didn't use that word. He used a different word to begin with an A. And uh, Free goes, oh, you know, but anyway, so I think that's some of time in the bars and understanding human nature and reading people until these guys are giving us a line. And uh, he got no cooperation from the Saudis. They were worried about optics with Syria and Iran. It didn't help much at all. And then he got a promotion at uh, New York City field office of, of the FBI. It's one of the major flagship, it was the flagship office. And he still hoped to move up. Yeah. And then it's getting close to his dream job. And O'Neill took to Manhattan like an olive to a martini glass. And agents with a similar passion gravitated toward him. He often entertained dignitaries regarding important information to bars. We try to get the FBI to reimburse them. They were stingy because they, you can't pay you for drinks and stuff like that. He, he did, so he did that all of his own money. Then, if you remember, in August 1998, the embassies in Africa, Tanzania, and Kenya were bombed, and 247 people were murdered. I'll use that word murdered. 5,000 wounded, and John and Neil immediately it was the work of Al-Qaeda. But there was a turf war within the FBI. That being an international incident, the, the Washington, D.C. wanted to address it, and the New York City office wanted to address it because they had more expertise. In the end, the New York City office got it, and John O'Neill. And, uh, and his, his, his aggressive work ethic rubbed many the wrong way and made some people even jealous. Uh, in the meantime, President Clinton was all mired in the Monica Lewinsky thing. If you remember that, he, he he didn't he was so mired in that he didn't care about much about international terrorism. And um, anyway, he he uh, he O'Neill went to Africa, and he provided a template for future terrorist incidents how to investigate them. And then in about 1999, his luck turned south. And he regularly used his own for government business. And, it, and his car broke down in June. And he went to a nearby FBI garage. I'm sorry. And, he went, and his girlfriend was struggling with him. And she needed to use the parking garage bathroom. And he ended up creating so many problems for him. It was a petty violation of FBI protocol, but John O'Neill was suspended for 15 days. And uh, the higher ups frown on his flamboyant lifestyle. No. In, a in April 2000, he lost his palm pilot at the Yankee game. Again, he self reported the incident, but immediately returned to the stadium and found it untouched. It'd be another blotch on his career. Uh, by May of 2000, uh, John, he was passed over for promotion and had the field officers pretty hurt. But those two blotches really didn't help any. But that same year, this was the kicker. In Orlando, Florida, he left the conference room to answer his pager for better reception. He left his briefcase in his seat unattended. Uh, and his briefcase contained classified information. When you get the return, the briefcase was gone. Uh, it was soon found to be uh, the, uh, the working of a petty theft worker in the hotel looking for money and valuables. And, uh, they forensically tested his briefcase and found it just what, untouched. But that was just what John O'Neill's enemies at the FBI needed to go after him. Even the Louis Free and Janet Reno were informed. It was no criminal intent, although technically not supposed to, many good bureaucrats take stuff out of their 
out of, out of the office, and he was one of them. After the briefcase incident, there was no pardoning for John O'Neill. He would be marginalized by the FBI. His rise and even his FBI career days were numbered. But the FBI's most key on Al-Qaeda was about to be sidelined, it was close to being sidelined. And then in October 2000, in the Gulf of Aden, south of Yemen, a guided missile destroyer, Cole, was bombed by a small boat with two aside bombers. The blast killed 17 sailors and injured dozens more while blowing up 50, excuse me, a 40 by 60 foot gash in the Coles hull. Uh, John O'Neill's boss, Louis Free at the FBI, said, you know, you're still the best person to tackle the coal investigation. So they sent him to Yemen. Yemen was a very dangerous place. Everybody carried an automatic weapon. After arriving in Yemen, in typical John O'Neill fashion, he didn't do things by the FBI book. After hours, he was whining, dining, smoozing, and nurturing dignitaries and telling officers, government officials, and policemen. And in Yemen, he came to trust and appreciate John O'Neill. And after his investigation style paid huge dividends, the enemy officials gave him key, gave him key details and where Al Qaeda safe houses were in Yemen, the specific city there. Uh, anyway, but Yemen, but the Yemeni ambassador Barbara Bobadilla did not get along with him. John O'Neill reasoned this such hospitality and building invaluable with future well-timed phone calls and future exchange. He viewed work with foreign dignitaries as a two-way street and freely exchange information. And his two credos were cooperation and communication. Also, it became certain to John O'Neill, local drum beats, the next target after the coal was going to be on U.S. soil. John O'Neill's reason that Al Qaeda wanted to bring down the World Trade Towers. When he returned over Thanksgiving from a break he, in Yemen, he had lost 25 pounds, but his intel gathering and entertainment expenses came out of his own pocket. He didn't want to deal with FBI bean counters. Then he had a clash with the Yemeni ambassador, Barbara Bodine. And uh, she always seemed more interested in placating Yemeni at the expense of not letting the FBI do their work. Bodine and Senator's own investigation and blatantly interfered with John O'Neill's team. She didn't understand or appreciate the concept of forensic science. She was very antagonistic to John O'Neill. And when he suggested that something was going to happen inside the United States, she thought he was full of it and she wouldn't listen to him. And uh, John O'Neill placed a high priority on, on protecting the safety of the people. That meant having more boots on the ground or enough boots on the ground to take care, take care of each other. Barbara Bodine could not care less about that. Uh, and she often dressed down John O'Neill's agents right in public. And she always sided with the King of Yemen, King Salah, over the FBI. During the Cole investigation, he went home for Thanksgiving on a visa. And when he said three turn up, we finished off the investigation. Bodin did not allow him to come back in, into Yemen. It's the first time this ever happened. Uh, a U.S. ambassador or not uh, a person, uh, another federal employee or a federal government representative to get back in the country. And what hurt uh, O'Neill the most is Louis Free did not go to bat for John O'Neill, and Neil was never allowed to go back and finish off the coal investigation himself. Many of his FBI agents stayed there, but many did. They had to come home with him. And the, and the Clinton administration, he thought that the Clinton administration's seriousness about spending more than time was, was screwed up by Monica Lewinsky. And by June 2001, he was removed from the coal investigation, although hot on Al Qaeda's tail. Uh, and FBI investigators told him to leave from Yemen with the coal investigation incomplete. Later on, he was not allowed back, but his men were still there working. And when this, when he arrived, when they finally were taken away at McGuire, they arrived at McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. O'Neill was on a tarmac to greet them for the good yet unfinished work. Now, and O'Neill was sure Al-Qaeda was going to strike in the United States very soon. And he had to retire. He was forced to retire for those incidents. On August 22nd, 2001, 75 FBI agents attended. He talked how much he loved the FBI. 
and many had tears in their eyes, including John O'Neill. He said, he mentioned, he'd just be a few blocks away from the World Trade Center. He started the World Trade Center the next day and was making three times the salary. Even though the World Trade Center seemed like an obvious target for something big, there was all kinds of problems with the World Trade Center security. Petty thefts, open drug use, and Islamic terrorists was just an afterthought. And uh, 9-11, 22 years ago and two days ago, Mohammed Atta roared his hijacked plane at maximum acceleration to the North Tower. General O'Neill was on his 34th floor of the South Tower. He felt, no, the jolt, you know, and he immediately went down to the lobby and tried to get people out of the North Tower as much as possible. Then when the sec second tower hit, he knew it was Osama bin Laden. And he ran in the lobby for a while, then he went up to the South Tower. He was last seen alive on the 49th floor of the South Tower, 16 minutes after he entered the tower, and the tower collapsed, killing him and many, many others. New York City lost 2,800 people that day. And John O'Neill had chased Osama bin Laden all over the world, but the end, Osama bin Laden caught up with him. Our next FBI director, Robert Mueller, devoted hundreds of agents to fight terror, 10 times more than General O'Neill. I don't know how many he had, probably 20 or 30. Many times more than John O'Neill had, as well, you know, as well as changing the FBI structure, uh, rigid structure on how to deal with these things. In closing, I'll say I love this. One committed man can unleash great evil. Osama bin Laden, Hitler, Mussolini, and just one man, John O'Neill, committed to fight the good fight is never enough to counter. Thank you. Wow. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you so much. <clears throat> All uh, right. Uh, so, 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 so sad story. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. He's a hero, though. You know, even though he had less of a personal life, he was a hero. Yeah. Well, um, I have a question for you. Um, okay. how, how did a young John O'Neill wind up wanting to be an FBI agent? Well, he saw that program as a child, the FBI. I remember it well, too. Um, and it's called the FBI with Evram Zimbalist Jr. being the lead role. They'd, so he saw it on TV and said, that's what I want to do. You know, I hear that kind of story often, but that's how I got into it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get into it. Uh-huh. Okay. So uh, once uh, reaching a supervisory level in the FBI, how did John O'Neill get along with everybody else in the in the Well, place? he had pointed elbows or sharp elbows is what they say a lot of people didn't like him because he he knew he was right and you know in the government environment you kind of got to be a little bit sit in the background for a while before you tell people what they should be doing and he didn't do that so a lot of his a lot of the supervisors thought this guy was brash but once his, and his people that work for him they it took him a while but they learned to love him they said they go anywhere with john o'neill because he was a good supervisor. He took care of him, and he expected him to work hard, much like the military, expected him to work hard and play hard. But he had uh, he had pointy elbows, or sharp elbows, was a common expression they use. Mm. Any questions from the audience? Well, I don't see any questions. Audience, please post your question. We can see your question. I've read a couple of books on him, including this one. Uh, Hey, where's it? The man who warned America. It's pretty good. Uh, okay, Catherine. I read. Catherine, Catherine said, wow, you did a lot of research on this. Oh, thank you. And Keith, a great story on someone I knew nothing about. Um, let's see. Feel free to ask questions, everybody. I'm going to uh, to show the picture of John O'Neill. Let me see if I can. Stand the dresser, yeah. Yeah. I'll, okay. Let me see. I, I I have a picture coming up. Coming. Hmm.
Yep, that's John O'Neill. That's um, with co courtesy of Murray West. West. Yes, that's it's in this book here. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, I, I worked out in the FBI building for six years, and I probably I might have very well bumped into him. For all you know, there's a lot of people in there, obviously. Mm. But yeah, I like I, I don't know what he looked like at the time when I was working out. So. Yeah, I have a color picture that. Yeah, same picture. Yeah. Yeah. This. Oh, great! Yeah. Yeah. But he died. He was one year younger than me. Uh, when I, at the same he was born in 1952. Uh huh. He died, you know, at 9/11. Yeah, he got it on there, February 6th. Yeah, he was quite a character. My kind of my kind of government bureaucrat, and there are people like that in the government, believe it or not. You know, we, we, and the government is just not full of people who don't do anything. You know, I hear some of our political saying, "I'll get rid of all the government people." That's you know, get rid of a guy like that who could have saved a lot of people. It's not right. Yeah. Well, everybody, feel free to post questions. Well, I'm sure when people watch the replay, they might post a question in the in the okay. Facebook group. Yeah. If you watch the replay, feel free to post any any comment in the Facebook group. All right. Rick, you did a wonderful job. Thank you for all this time that you spent researching and reading and learning about John O'Neill. It's a wonderful person and a, a powerful yeah. person. Maury Weiss is the book that's probably very good called The Man Who Warned the man who can't see it, the man who warned America. Mm. And, uh, it's a good book. You get you know in uh, award winning, but uh, it, it whew, you know I read it and I go wow you know. Yeah. Well, sometimes when when we feel safe and we sometimes we take safety for granted. Yeah. All right. Well, seem like we don't have any more question, but I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure when people watch the replay, they will uh, make comments. But uh, I appreciate you so much, Rick, for doing your wonderful job. And we will see you back in one month. Yeah, I'll probably talk about Colin Powell, another guy. I used to see him regularly when he was a full bird colonel. I'll uh, talk, probably talk about him next. You've got to be dead for me to talk about you. So anyway, I, I know him, and uh, he's he was a good guy and a great soldier. Yeah. So the next, um, the next talk will be October 11th. That sounds right. October 11. It's on always on the second Wednesday. So mark your calendar. Don't miss, don't miss it. And um, I'm happy to host this show. And thank you so much again, Rick. And goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of September.